grazie. Ok. Um, great, so we are already up and running. So uh, thanks a lot for being around uh, early in the morning. So um, lecture number three, thermodynamics of uh, non-equilibrium quantum processes. Uh, we, are now, we are now familiar uh, with, the way, with the way we have to infer work in, a, um, in this non-equilibrium framework. And when uh, the process that induces work is a genuine um, quantum, mechanical, quantum mechanical evolution. And uh, what we do now uh, are two, two different things. Okay, so to, what we will, we will be doing in these 50 minutes will be um, exploiting the sort of knowledge that we gathered um, during, during the, the, first, the first two discussions to assess um, two different problems. The first one, um, is, related, uh, is related to open system dynamics and will be the focus of hopefully the next 25 minutes. Okay? So we go through uh, open system dynamics, we extend the formalism that I've introduced for work to heat, and, and we see how that can help us understanding a fundamental principle in physics, which is Landauer principle, that was hinted at yesterday uh, by, by Martin Plenio, um, and try to, to, to get a justification for, a justification for its uh, validity uh, from a genuine, genuine non-equilibrium framework. While um, the second part of today's, today's discussion will focus on, on irreversibility. I've already had quite a few, a few uh, questions about uh, topics related related to irreversibility, and therefore I would like to, to spend some words um, about that, okay? So, um, let's have a look. Um, yeah, this is the plan for the discussion for the, for the um, first half of, the, of, of, of this presentation, okay? So, we go and address Landauer's principle for quantum uh, open system dynamics. And what we say the goal is to provide a non-equilibrium version of Landauer principle, okay? So we want to use the framework for non-equilibrium dynamics and non-equilibrium thermodynamics that we have, um, that we have um, um, introduced so far to uh, justify, so to say, um, Landauer itself. And um, in passing, we will, we will also see how it is possible to actually improve Landauer, Landauer's original formulation for his principle. Um, a byproduct of our discussion will be uh, the um, identification of the role of a very special feature of open system dynamics, which is called unitality, in, um, in this non-equilibrium framework for, for thermodynamics. Okay? So um, we went through work extensively, I would say, um, in, the, like, in the previous two discussions. How about heat? Right? So, um, how about um, trying and gather a, a similar description, similar stochastic description for a process where a system, again, the very, the very not your favorite quantum system, is in contact with its, own, with its own environment. And differently from what we did so far, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to allow this system to be kicked by a time-dependent process. So, um, up until yesterday, we explicitly considered the, the case of a unitary dynamic, so no environment whatsoever, if not for the preparation of the initial state of the system, and a time-dependent Hamiltonian, so a process, a unitary evolution, uh, that drove the dynamics of my, of, my, of, my, of my work medium. In this framework, on the other hand, I'm, I'm not putting in the bucket my, in the bin, my, my time evolution, my time um, dependent um, Hamiltonian, not time dependent Hamiltonian, on the other, and replace it with the contact, with the interaction with an environment. Now, in this context, um, there were, I mean, quite a few, quite a few um, instances of, of um, study of this work. I mean, there is a reference missing here from, from, again, from the Augsburg group, it will appear later on. You can reformulate the very same framework for um, work in terms of a new stochastic variable, in terms of heat this time. So what these two guys exchange is energy, but in a different form, in an incoherent form. 
heat. And you can define a probability distribution for heat that resembles very closely what, you, uh, what we have seen for, for work until yesterday. There are quite a few subtleties, quite a few differences that we need to, that we need to, to go through. The first one is that we are going to shift our attention from the system to the environment. Okay? So uh, if you remember the description, no, the, the form for the work probability distribution, no, the, the um, expression for the work probability distribution that I gave um, up to yesterday was so, something like this. No? So these transition rates, these transition probabilities, um, the initial probability to find the system in one of its eigenstates, and uh, then that the, the work, the amount of work that we were, we were getting was given by the difference in energy between the initial eigenvalue and the, and the final one, right? The difference in value between initial and final energy eigenvalues. And these were related to the system, no? I, I performed measurements on the system, and these guys were the outcomes of the measurements upon, performed upon the system. Here, everything that you see in this expression should be referred to the environment. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming that I have some possible control, some form of control upon the environment itself. The environment is an object with a given Hamiltonian. Hamiltonians of which I, I, um, I know the eigenstates and the corresponding eigenvalues. And these guys are the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian of my environment. Okay? So what I'm asking is how much heat the environment exchange with the system or vice versa and what is the change in energy in the environment that the environment is subjected to due to its coupling with the system? Make sense? What are these probabilities? Well, uh, these probabilities are referred precisely to the environment itself. So the environment is, for instance, in a thermal state, right, in a Gibbs state. Uh, these PM are the analogous of my P and not. They are the probabilities that at the beginning of my process, no, when I perform um, the first measurement on my environment, I find the environment in the nth eigenstate of its Hamiltonian. After the interaction, right, after the system has exchanged um, heat with the environment for a given tau, for a given time, I measure again the state of the environment, and I wonder what is the probability that this time the environment is found in the nth energy eigenstate, given that at the beginning I found it in the nth energy eigenstate of its Hamiltonian. Does it make sense, guys? Yes? The difference in energy, the difference in values between these two, these two, these two eigenvalues, the corresponding eigenvalues, provides you with the amount, gives you the, the value of the stochastic variable Q that um, embodies, embodies the work that, uh, sorry, the, the heat exchanged between the two systems. Please. I'm deaf. I apologize. Oh, yeah. You, if you want, you, you, you yes. Yeah, say, you can, you can assume you are detaching, attaching, detaching. Is fixed in time. Is fixed in time. There is nothing dependent in, on time. Not, not a, priori, a priori. You can put some, some intrinsic time dependence in the Hamiltonian of the environment, but nothing that depends on the coupling uh, between system and environment itself. Okay. Um, so the analogy, yeah, and uh, the, the third arrow is redundant. So the analogy with the work probability distribution is quite, is quite, is quite strong, huh? and I don't need to stress it, to stress it again. So these allows us to set somehow the framework for the study now of processes where I allow for an explicit exchange of heat between uh, environment and my, and, my, and my working system. That's it. OK, um, what is the link between, uh, say, open system dynamics and um, fluctuation, fluctuation theorem, theorems? Again, uh, this ca came already came up already yesterday from, from a few of your, of your questions. And uh, the answer is, is the following. So, so the answer to the question, what happens to the fluctuation theorems when my dynamics is explicitly open, is that uh, it's, it's an open question. I mean, we don't know yet. 
explicitly. What we know is that uh, the standard fluctuation theorems, those two expressions that we went through yesterday, you know, Yajinsky identity and Tasaki Crooks one, well, these two guys are unaffected as long as my process, my open process, is a unital process. Now, let's go through um, what a unital process is very briefly. So the definition is, is, very, is, very, is very simple, it's very easy. No? So uh, if I perform, no, if I have an Hamiltonian process, now my handwriting, you know, is um, fantastically awful. So uh, if you don't read what I'm writing, just let me know, okay? So for an Hamiltonian uh, process where I define an Hamiltonian, I have a time evolution operator U, which is if this guy uh, is a time dependent object, an explicitly time dependent object, well, this guy is the result of uh, the exponentiation of uh, my Hamiltonian. And this object here, this, this operator T, is the time ordering operator, right? The Dyson ordering operator that orders basically the expansion of this exponential time. And my, um, what happens is that any initial state of my system evolves according to uh, these dynamics, right? So this gives me the state at time tau. If I have a open, an open process, which means um, the world doesn't end with my system, there is an environment. This environment is coupled to my system. They exchange energy, information in general, right? Then I have to abandon the unitary description of the evolution. I know that this is very well known to everyone. It's just say, just to uh, reiterate a few concepts. So what I should do is to replace my Hamiltonian and time evolution operator with a general map, right? So I define a map phi. Yeah, that acts upon my initial state rho i of my system. This map is in general a time dependent object that drives the state, no, guides the state to the final state rho tau. Okay? Now, uh, this guy, this map, rho tau, transforms density matrices into density matrices. So it's a physical uh, map preserves the trace of your density matrix because it's transforming density matrices into density matrices. So it's a completely positive trace preserving map. And it's unital when if I apply it, when applied to the identity matrix, leaves such a density matrix unaffected. Okay? So we define a map, an open map, as unital whenever it doesn't um, alter, it doesn't modify the identity, the identity matrix. Uh, now, there are examples of, easy examples of maps that don't satisfy this condition. And um, one example, a very, very straightforward example, is an example where, is the example where the, uh, is amplitude damping, no? So do you know amplitude damping? Dissipation energy, right? So suppose that you have a two-level system, like the one that um, Christoph Wunderlich has taken yesterday, has explained yesterday, right? So a zero and a one, or a, no, these are embodied by the ground, and the excited state of, of a qubit, an ion, an atom, no? Anything, anything into which you want to encode information. And suppose that you are prepared this initial state of the system, so in an excited state, if you take the system and put it into a dissipative bath, right, so a bath that sucks an energy from the system, what happens is that after a long time, or a relatively long time, you will find, you will find the system into its ground state, right? So the energy of the system, of the system has been absorbed by the environment, I've lost the excitation, and I went all the way down to zero. So now you can, you can understand immediately that if I prepare an incoherent mixture, right? So if my initial state, rho i, is 1, 1 plus 0, 0 over 2, 
for normalization, right? So if I'm prepared, preparing as initial state the identity matrix, makes sense, yeah? No, properly normalized. What will happen through this channel, through the dissipative channel, is that whatever is in one will disappear. So I will not find one in my evolved density matrix, in my evolved state. And all the, say, the, the, entire, the entire density matrix will all be ascribed by the zero state, right? So eventually, after dissipation, I will end up with this state, with the zero, zero state, right? So clearly, a map such as that, so dissipation, doesn't preserve the identity matrix. So it's not, it's not unital. Make sense? Yeah? Okay, examples of unital maps, yeah, equally easy, dephasing, right? So dephasing is, on the other hand, a different uh, open process is a different open process that does the following. Now, suppose that your initial state is something, is something like this, is a, um, a 1 minus A for normalization. So I'm writing down my density matrix. B, B star, OK? And A and B are related to each other in a way that the eigenvalues of this, of this object are all positive. The trace. Trace equal to one, I'm enforcing it already. So assume that A and B satisfy all the right conditions to make it a proper, a proper density matrix. What the phasing would do, what the phasing would do would be to kill these off-diagonal elements, leaving the diagonal elements unaffected. So the state at a time tau will read A one minus A with a zero here, okay, when tau is very, very long, okay? So what, you, what this channel does is that it doesn't, touch, it doesn't touch the probability that the system is found in its excited or in its ground state, yeah? But it kills the coherence between, between, the, the, between such states. So if this is the action of your channel, it is extremely simple to see that if I now take here one half and one half, regardless, and zero and zero here, right? So if I start from a row i which has this structure, so it's proportional to the identity matrix, after the action of dephasing, I'm going to find exactly the same, exactly the same state. So dephasing is unital. Okay, so there are pretty pretty physical examples of unitality or lack thereof. Yeah. Well, under channels such as dephasing, fluctuation theorems are una formally unaffected. Okay, uh, we now dig into the, into into the actual and our principle. Okay, so and I'm I'm say reporting, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting there and displaying the statement by, uh, taken from the 1965 paper by, by, by Landauer. So what he stated is that any logical irreversible processing of information is accompanied, he says, it must be accompanied by a corresponding entropy increase in the system or the environment, okay? So in, this, in, the, in the part of my, of my, of my device that um, doesn't bear, say, doesn't bear information. And um, this process must be accompanied by a, dissipative, by a dissipative process itself. So I need to dissipate heat into an environment because I'm processing information. Now, uh, Landauer was a, basically an engineer, I mean, a physicist, but he was, he was, he was very much interested in, in um, not in engineering processes. So he was interested in understanding what are the ultimate limitation to impose by physics to the processing of information. And the statement, right, the principle, um, is fundamental, but is not, it's a, it's a principle. So there is no, as far as I know, there is no proof of Landauer, Landauer principle, right? So, and um, a cartoon, as usual, 
allows, allows us to understand a in a better way what, what words entail, what words want to explain, okay? So suppose that um, this is my system, so this, uh, this uh, polygon here is my system, and that I've encoded information in the color of this object and the shape of this object, okay? So the information I want to process is shape and color. I now process such an information. Let me, let me finish and then, and then you ask me your question, right? Um, after the interaction with the environment, the color has been lost, right? Has been changed. Well, what, so I imp I've implemented this manipulation of information step that Landauer entailed. What Landauer states is that uh, this change in entropy, right? So the entropy of the, ch of the system has changed because the information content of the state of the system has changed, must be accompanied by, say, a dissipative process, by some heat that gets dissipated into the environment, okay? And this heat is lower bounded by the amount of information change in terms of an entropy quantifier of entropy change in the state of the system, okay? So this is Landauer principle in its, really, in its bare formulation, right? No. Um, it's a verification of, in my opinion, of, it's a beautiful experiment, fantastic experiment, um, but it's a verification. So, Vaid is referring to uh, an experiment published two or three years ago in Nature, um, where by using a double well, they uh, proved Landauer principle, so they assessed Landauer principle, reaching the lowest possible exchange of heat that the system can, 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 can achieve. So to me, that is a, say, a, it's a test of Landauer, but it's not a proof of, uh, a, a proof of its validity. Say, God knows if you, there is any other, any other process that will go below, below that, right? So to me, there is a, a strong motivation to look into Landauer's principle and try to make it emerge from microscopic principles. I mean, this statement was, stated there, was given in 1965, a long time ago, has been uh, tested and retested, used and reused, um, assessed in many ways, but can we make it emerge from fundamental considerations, from a microscopic pers say, perspective? And um, I'm not the, p the first person to, to address the question, okay, to ask the question, and um, other people did. Um, Esposito did it, um, um, a, few, a few years ago, and uh, getting very close to this, to this um, say, um, microscopic derivation of the principle itself. And, um, and among the various formulations of, of such attempts at proving Landauer microscopically, um, I really like the approach by these two guys, uh, Rieb and Wolf, uh, in 2014, uh, I really liked it because the framework that they set is very natural. It's a minimalistic setting that adheres perfectly with somehow the way we understand quantum mechanics and the way we describe open system dynamics. Okay, let's go through that before digging into the non-equilibrium formulation of it. Right, so what do we have? We have uh, an initial state of my system, rho s, and this is the guy was information content I want to manipulate. And I have my environment, right, which uh, the, the picture is taken directly from that from the, from the paper, okay? So they call it R for reservoir. And the reservoir is initially, at a, say, in a thermal state at a given inverse temperature, beta. And the dimensions of the two systems are different, okay? So, uh, say, the system uh, lives in a Hilbert space of dimension ds, the, the reservoir in a Hilbert space of dimension dr. So what they do is that they assume initially a factorized state of system and environment, so no correlation whatsoever between these two guys. They let them interact unitarily, so there is a microscopic process that connects system and environment. This gives you a joint state, rho dash, of system and environment, in general, a correlated state, 
of system and environment, maybe even an entangled state, mm, depends on the dynamics, and um, from which I can extract the reduced state of the system, rho s dash, and the reduced state of the reservoir, rho r, da rho r dash. And then they proceed to define quantities that are pretty natural. On one hand, there is the change in entropy, or minus the change in entropy, between uh, the initial state of the system and its final one. So this is the content of inform the information content that has changed due to the interaction with the environment. There is an analogous quantity, delta, which is the change in entropy between the final state of the environment and the initial state of the environment. And then there is the average heat that is exchanged between system and environment in light of their coupling, in light of their interaction. Does it make sense? So this delta Q is the change in energy in the environment, as I said, in this, in this perspective, in this, say, in this framework, we should look at the environment when we want to quantify the amount of heat exchanged with the system. So this is the change in energy of the environment after and before the interaction. Make sense? So if the energy of the environment has changed, this was due to the interaction with the system. Make sense? Yeah? So I have all the ingredients to assess Landauer. And what they, what they get are two, two, states, so two results, two very nice results. The first one is this, is fundamental. So to say this is an attempt at somehow um, proving Landauer, uh, not proving Landauer, and also showing that there is life beyond Landauer's initial state, more original statement. So what they show is that the average dissipated heat, delta Q is defined here, right? The average dissipated heat is, is given exactly, right, by delta S, so the change in entropy of the state of the system. Fair enough. This was in Landauer itself. Then there is this object I, and I is the mutual information. Uh, did Professor Plenio went go through that? Yes. So you know what mutual information is. So these, in very layman words, these accounts for the total correlations between system and environment both classical and quantum, OK? So no distinction whatsoever. But this gives you basically the measure of how correlated system and environments are after the interaction, their mutual interaction. Then there is a third term, which is a relative, a relative entropy, yeah? A relative entropy between the state of the environment before its interaction with the system and the state of the environment after the interaction with the system. Now, relative entropy, familiar? Are we familiar with relative entropy? Can I see hands up? Good, great, fantastic. So we know everything here. Now, relative entropy is a positive quantity, actually, is a non-negative quantity. Mutual information is a non-negative quantity, and the change in entropy is a non-negative quantity in this, in this context. So what they have is that, or in, uh, well, basically, OK, forget about the delta S, but these two guys are positive. So certainly, this guy is larger than just this guy, right? So if I take this left-hand side and this right-hand side, I have Landauer. But what they are showing you is that from this minimalistic, perfectly adherent, fra to, adherent to quantum mechanics framework that they have set, they can justify the emergence of Landauer principle from microscopic consideration, from elementary considerations, without having to specify what is the form of the interaction between system and environment, but only having to assume, say, assuming initially a factorized state between system and environment. I know um, some of you might consider that a very strong assumption. It is a strong assumption, but um, say, as someone once told me, it gives you it gives you the smell of things, no? It gives you the idea of how things would, would, would work in practice, okay? So this is the first result by Rieb and Wolf. There is a second one, which is equally nice. You, have, you had a question? Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're right. So what? Um, 
not, not sure that you are counting twice. What is true is that this decomposition, say, this way, way you're writing down things is not unique, right? So in order to let them merge I and the, and the D, they are to add and subtract terms no, in, a, in, a, in, a smart, in a smart way. They are not counting twice. They are not counting twice things. Yes, you are right. I contains the, the, contains the, the, the change in entropy of the system. This is, this is true, but say, I think this, is, this um, way of writing things is to highlight two things that are extremely important when you deal with open system dynamics. Uh, one is what happens to the state of the environment, right? So, upon, so we, always, we are always concerned with what happens to the state of the system, yeah? But what happens to the state of the environment is something that is equally informal, even equally important. And um, it's actually a fundamental a building block of measures for non-Markovianity uh, that have been proposed a few years ago, in particular the one by Breuer, Pilo, and, and Leine. So one reason for which non-Markovianity emerges from an open system dynamics is that you might change the state of the environment. And there you get, there you go. No, 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 only at the beginning. There is no assumption, in fact, the state changes, no? So otherwise, I would, this distance will be zero, and I will not need any, 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 uh, any D-term in this expression. Sure. The temperature of the environment is set. 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 It's set at the start. At the start. But then, it can be then the state of the environment can change. You have, if you want, you have, if you want, you have a, a second environment with which your environment has been in touch. It thermalized it. It thermalized with that. You detach it. And from that, that point on, that is the, the whole world around your system. Good digestion. <laughs> so if, if you're okay, can I, can I go ahead with the second, yeah, the second result? So the second result is that um, it is, a, is a, lot, a lot more hands-on. So they started playing around with these expressions, writing them explicitly. And what they found is that you can, you can write explicitly this guy in a way that depends formally on the dimension of your environment, right? D here is the dimension of your environment. You see it's there, right? So what they, stay, what they have as a second result is that uh, the new bound that they find for Landauer depends explicitly on the dimension of your, of your environment, right? And this is tighter than delta S in general. So not only you can um, formulate, you can formulate a sort of justification for semi-first principles of, of Landauer statement, but you can also um, aim at improving it, have a hope to get a better, tighter bound than the initial one, than the original one formulated by, by Landauer himself. It depends on the dimension, right? So if the dimension of the system explodes, so grows to infinity, so you go towards uh, the paradigm of a, of a proper, no, a proper infinite dimensional environment, right, like the one that we usually consider in Markovian dynamics, then uh, what remains is only delta S, and you retrieve Landauer. So the original formulation of Landauer principle is somehow implying, no, assuming, without telling it to you, asymptotically an infinite dimension of your, of your, of your environment. That's log squared, yes, log squared. Um, all the details are in this long but very nicely, nicely written paper. Okay, um, and this is Landau, say, this is the formulation by, 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 these, two, by these two guys, no? the attempt at formulating, at justifying Landauer from, um, from this um, microscopic or semi-microscopic picture. It's not the, what I want to show you, no? I want to, I want to show you that the non-equilibrium framework that we went through, uh, so the, all the pain you have, been, you have been through until now, it's worth 
when, when you aim at justifying Landauer itself, okay? Uh, well, the statement, not Landauer. Landauer doesn't need any justification. <laughs> He's dead <laughs> anyway. So uh, let's try and see if we can make use of what we, what we, um, we learned to understand not only how Landauer emerged, but whether, whether really a tighter bound can exist, okay? So let's take again a formulation that is very close to the one by Rieb and Wolf. So you have your system, you have your environment, they interact through a unitary evolution. And um, let's set the context uh, in these terms. So I have an Hamiltonian of my total system plus environment device, right? So I have the Hamiltonian of my system, the Hamiltonian of the environment, and the Hamiltonian that generates the interaction between system and environment. Okay, so the coupling term. As um, Ribbon Wolf did, let's assume that initially system and environment are completely uncorrelated, and let's assume that the environment is initially prepared in a thermal state at some inverse temperature, which, again, works as a reference and nothing else but a reference at the beginning. Okay, now I want to uh, retrieve explicitly the state of the system after the interaction with the environment, okay? So this is my initial state, this factorized state, right? U is the time evolution operator joining together system and environment. And then um, I'm interested in the state of the environment itself. So in the state of the environment after the interaction, so what I do is that I trace over the system. Make sense? Now, up until the trace, up until a step before the trace, everything is unitary, so I'm here, that's great, right? But the moment I take the trace over the system, I lose unitarity. So the effective dynamics of my, system, of my environment won't be unitary anymore. Its purity will change, right? And the description of the effective dynamics that this environment will undergo is through one of such maps, right? A map that can be decomposed in terms of Krauss operators. People know what Krauss operators are, yeah? Okay, so I see yeah, it's nodding. So Krauss operators are operators, in general non-unitary operators, that um, are these guys, AL and AL dagger, that they need is a set that they need to account for the open system evolution, open evolution of a given, of a given, of a given system, of a given information, information carrier system, okay? And um, if L, no, I, I need a set, and a set of them, a suitably, a suitably large uh, set of them. If the set is larger than one, so it contains more than one element, the dynamics is for sure non-unitary. Non and uh, there is one property that these guys, where did I leave the chalk? One property that these guys, that these Krauss operators have to satisfy. So uh, the Krauss operators satisfy a closure relation or a completeness relation, which is the sum of L of AL dagger, AL, equal to the identity, okay? So uh, this must be the case, okay? If you want to work with proper um, Krauss operator, this should, be, this should be guaranteed. Yeah, and this is the definition, right, for, for this specific case. And I wrote down my closure relation explicitly. Okay, now what happens at this stage? Well, what happens is that I want to use, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm coupling directly my system to this environment. Um, I'm interested in heat because I want to assess Landauer. So why not using what I learned um, five or six slides ago, right? So why not using the, the fact that in this non-equilibrium framework that we, we now know should be, should be adopted when assessing the thermodynamics of, of open quantum systems, um, why not using the probability distribution for heat, given that heat is a stochastic variable, right? So why, why, shall I, why cannot I use, why should I, yeah, let me use this guy, yeah, let's, let's make use of that. And let's make use of that, so the heat probability distribution, you know. I want to use this uh, probability distribution explicitly, so I want to write it in terms of these Krauss operators. And the form that the probability distribution takes is this one, right? So uh, rho EMM are the Gibbs probabilities 
of my initial environmental state, what did we say? We said that the environmental state, rho e, is in a thermal state at some inverse temperature, beta. Yeah? So the probability that I find this is the environment in its nth eigenstate before interacting with the system will be simply the diagonal element of this density matrix. This in the mth, no? So in, right, this is in the mth basis, this is in the m basis, this is a diagonal element. So what I get is this probability to be this stuff. On the other hand, the probability of transition from such a, say, from the nth energy eigenstate of the environment to the nth energy eigenstate of the environment are regulated, are given by the Krauss operators that I have introduced. And also, these guys replace the time evolution operator U, the unitary time evolution operator U, to give me the rates of transition. So this is the explicit form that my probability distribution for heat exchange takes when I assume the framework presented in the previous slide. And now I get curious. I get curious, and just like what we did yesterday with Yazinski, no, where we have assessed what happens to the expectation value of e to minus beta w, the work that I do on the system, or that the system does for me, I now get curious and calculate the expectation value of e to minus beta q, the new stochastic variable, the heat-related stochastic variable. So what I do is that I calculate this average, right? So I plug in this expression. I play a bit with uh, algebra, right? Uh, along the same lines as of, of, of yesterday's calculation. And um, what matters is the following, is that the expectation value of e to minus beta q is related to the trace of the initial density matrix of my environment times this operator A. And now, uh, it's so important that I want to stress it. So operator A not is not the identity. A is the sum over L of AL, AL dagger. It's not my closure relation. Make sense? Yeah? What is that? Well, whenever A is the identity, and this can happen perfectly fine, the map is unital. Okay, so this is the statement. This condition is the unitality statement in terms of Krauss operators. So the only thing that, so we, we can gather a lot of information from this stuff. The first thing that we gather is that there is a link between the degree of non-unitality of a process, right? And the exchange, the statistics of exchange of heat in an open system dynamics. So the value that this guy takes is strongly dependent on how non-unital your process is. Assume that you have a unital process. So assume that this operator, um, this bold face A, is the identity. Then what you have here on the right hand side is the trace of the identity times rho e. One, statement, no, a statement of fluctuation-like, fluctuation theorem-like statement along the lines of what we have seen, we have seen yesterday, right? Uh, there we go. So now we have, uh, let me go through a step. So now we have that for unital processes, so if A is the identity, then the expectation value of E to minus beta Q is equal to 1. Make sense? It's, it's just what we are getting from this expression. Then you use something called Jensen inequality. Jensen inequality that tells you, if I'm not wrong, that something like e to uh, the expectation value of e to the x 
is larger or equal to e to the expectation value of x. Okay? So use Jensen inequality, plug it here, replace this, this expectation value with the expectation value of e to minus beta, so with e to minus beta expectation value of q, and what you can derive immediately is that the average heat that you exchange can only be non-negative. So unital processes are associated with a positive exchange of heat from the system, uh, from the, from the, from the, uh, between system and environment, from the system to the environment. But whenever It means very little. It just means, it just means you, don't have, you don't have the reverse process. What is important is what happens when the dynamics is non-unital, when the, when the process goes beyond, no, when the map goes beyond the condition for unitality on the blackboard. When the process is non-unital, I have, using again Jensen inequality, I have a new bound to the amount of heat that I can exchange. A new bound that depends explicitly on the degree of non-unitality of my map. And this new bound is what the non-equilibrium framework for, for thermodynamics tells you sh you should adopt as bound for Landauer-like approach. Okay? So this is the bound that you should compare to Landauer, that you should use for a comparison with Landauer. Uh, we have already seen, through the Rieben-Wolf approach, that, say, tighter bound to Landauer can exist. So the question now becomes, is this bound tighter than Rieben-Wolf's one? Right? So, um, where is the try? I keep, I keep on losing it. So, um, on one end, we have beta expectation value of Q larger or equal than delta S. And this is Landauer original formulation. Rib and Wolf are somewhere here. Yeah? They say, well, it depends on the dimension of my system. I can have a tighter bound. I can be somewhere between this quantity and this quantity and be tighter than Landauer. We know, so Rib and Wolf. Then we have this non-equilibrium Non-equilibrium formulation of, of Landauer principle as a justification for Landauer principle, for, for, for the validity of Landauer, that provides a new bound. Where are we? Are we here? So, are we here? Is this the condition? Or shall I swap them? Is uh, ribbon wolf tighter than the non-equilibrium process, the non-equilibrium non -equilibrium, uh, bound? Well, uh, Providing an answer uh, turns out to be extremely, extremely difficult. It's a pretty much case-dependent uh, answer. We went through a couple, well, more than a couple, quite an extensive uh, set of, of, of tests, and we always find that the non-equilibrium bound is tighter than Rieben-Wolf's one, especially, especially at, say, at, at, at low temperatures. At low temperature of the environment, we almost always beat by a non-equilibrium approach to, to Landauer principle what uh, the equilibrium, but quantum mechanical approach to, to, to Landauer would tell you. Okay? Um, I'm not going, for obvious reasons, I'm not going through the, the, the set of examples. So um, if, I'm right, if the chairman can confirm, I, sh I think my time is up. Two minutes. So, yeah, I, I want to use the two minutes. I want to use the two minutes simply to, to uh, iterate a couple, of, a couple of points, okay? That went through, not came up through the discussions after the lectures and uh, in, the, in the afternoons. Uh, this is a very, very new framework, okay? Uh, the attempt at putting together information theoretical approach and non-equilibrium thermodynamics is something relatively, relatively new. Uh, it's a field that is growing. There are more open questions than, than satisfactory answers provided. 
there is room for fun, there is room for understanding from what happens fundamentally at the level of quantum, quantum dynamics. From a very general framework, from a general, very general standpoint, which is the one provided by thermodynamics. So if you have a penchant for funda foundations of quantum mechanics, and as, as, I, as I do, you, you, um, you believe that uh, probably the most general framework in physics is the one provided by thermodynamics. Have a, have a go at putting the two together. So uh, start working in this area. It's an extremely rewarding, rewarding field. Um, you have fun. You understand a little bit of, a little bit of physics in a new way. And, um, and you, try, you try to approach, to close the gap, between, uh, well, basically, the gap that we have, we have, we have um, say, highlighted at the beginning, no? You have the possibility to build machines of a quantum mechanical nature, right? You want to, to build this framework for this paradigm for quantum technologies. But we already have a very efficient theoretical framework for the understanding of how such engines, such machines work, which is thermodynamic. So it's only natural to bridge the gap between the two and trying and gather, say, get advantages from each other. So uh, if anything, these three lectures, I hope, putting you the uh, curiosity to explore this area. And if you have any, any uh, question, any, any um, doubt about what I've presented or what you're going to read, hopefully, feel free to write me an email. I'm more than happy to discuss. With that, I'm done, and I thank you for I thank you the organizer for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about this stuff, and you for enjoying <laughs> for three for three hours. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.